Logic magicians, we are the coolest. Logic magicians, that's me and Johnny. Logic magicians, that's who we are. This is subjective part two. Excellent. By the way, folks, that was completely on the spot. <laughs> completely improv. Everything I do is. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, hey, everyone. Uh, our first video ended up being about twice as long as we had wanted these videos to be. So we decided to split it in two, which is why this introduction is going to kind of have an abrupt continuation into the second part of that video. And in this part, we're going to be talking about and continue to talk about the concept of subjective and objective statements and kind of their implications. Hope you enjoy it. Enjoy, guys. Bye. Can you do a strong, effective, deductive argument? Sure. So, and again, when I'm when I'm initially teaching this to my seventh graders, I make a really strong distinction between inductive and deductive logic. The you know the boundary between those two are are certainly a little bit more fuzzy than just my definitions allow. You absolutely could use an inference rule in a subjective um, and kind of mostly subjective argument, right? Um, and we'll kind, of, we'll kind of dive into deductive logic a little bit more. There's a few more vocab terms. Uh, we call the um, statements in deductive logic premises. Um, we call the kind of mathematical structures. We call those valid structures. And then the conclusion that you come to using true premises and valid structures are called sound arguments. Now, you could certainly use... What about invalid structures? Are those like really, <laughs> you know, weak? Well, any, so an argument that doesn't follow those strict structures is actually considered an invalid structure, not an invalid structure. <laughs> Although, I mean, that's a question of pronunciation. <laughs> um, and yeah, so with with you can certainly use deductive logical structures, so the inference rule or valid structures in a primarily subjective argument, but you can't actually ever have a sound or, again, there's another level to that called cogent um, argument. You can only ever come to a, still only come to a subjective conclusion, um, and it's going to depend, and its efficacy, I guess, is going to depend on whether or not your audience, whether or not the people you're arguing with accept your subjective statements as being true, yeah. right? So for example, um, if, oh, I'm trying to think of kind of an example off the top of my head. Um, Use the bottom, they'd be there longer. You know? <laughs> if I say, um, you know, if cats are jerks, which I have two cats, Zach, you have a cat, we love cats, cats are awesome. Um, but if I say, if cats are jerks, then they shouldn't be pets. Cats are jerks, therefore they shouldn't be pets. Um, those are all subjective statements. But they're within... Right? The but they're using a what's called a modus ponens, uh, which just means a method of affirming, um, deductive logical structure inference rule. Um, so it, it means that if you're talking to someone who agrees that cats are jerks, then they and they agree that if cats are jerks and they shouldn't be pets, then they'll agree with your conclusion, right? Because that does lead to a kind of necessarily true conclusion so long as people agree with your basic premises. But you can't ever have, you can't actually have a true, necessarily true conclusion with that because you're ending on a subjective conclusion. And it depends on whether or not a person agrees with the subjective premises that you're using. Now, there is one more thing I kind of wanted to talk about um, within this before we, we kind of shut things down. Yeah, wrap up, not shut things down. That's, I don't know, that seems a little bit more. Down a computer again. That's true, that's true. Um, but the, what I wanted to talk about, and this kind of goes back to that discussion of subjective versus objective, and where there's some, some gray areas in those definitions um, are these things called social constructs. Oh. Um, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's so hear what, down. Yeah, what, what, what is, what is, when you hear the word social construct, what do you, what do you think? Oh, I think a lot of things. Uh, my 
wife Lindsay, she's going through a master's in biblical interpretation, implications and applications of biblical interpretation right now. And she just oh, wow. finished up with uh, um, uh, hermeneutics and Ooh. did her final paper on feminist theory, which looks at social structures in a very mm -hmm. different way. So I've got that on my mind of yeah. like, oh, geez, how do you define a social structure? Those well, are... so again, it's social construct. It's a little bit different than social oh. structure. Geez, oh, I got the wrong word in my head. <laughs> you construct a structure in construction, but this is yes. Well, and 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 I would actually probably say social structures are a type of social construct. Oh. Um, so there, and especially with with feminist theory, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion of social constructs and social hierarchies, power dynamics, things like that. Um, and a lot of that does, and social constructs are kind of foundational in a lot of those discussions. So my definition for a social construct is um, something that isn't real, but it functions as real because people believe it is real. Like money. Exactly. That's actually always the example that I, I give. So money, you know, if we were to pull out a dollar bill or in your case, if you pull, pulled out a pound, Right there, there's not necessarily inherent value to that beyond nice, beyond like the material that makes it up, right? Um, and actually, for my students, um, I go through this whole thing where like I draw on that you know, I say like you know, we talk about money, and then I draw on a piece of paper. I'm like, well, money is paper, and here's this piece of paper. So, you know, I'll give you this, and you give me your Chromebook. Yeah. <laughs> and students are like, but but no, no, that's 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 no, that doesn't work that way. I'm like, you're right, but why doesn't it work that way? And they're like, well, because, and then they, they actually do usually work it out that money has value because we give it value, right? If I went into a- Refraining right now from just quoting name of the wind. <laughs> like, Go for it. Okay, good. Thanks for giving me that permission. <laughs> so what do you know about this, what could you tell me about uh, this currency? What do you want to know about it? Do you want to know the, the chemical makeup of it, the history of it, the, the, what do you, and the history of it? Long ago, there was the people in the Xiong and they, one day, they used bartering system and then they found uh, that they had a great source of metal beneath their thing, their, their, their land, and they were able to work that. And so then that actually, this represents a larger structure of a whole, and all of them together equal this larger one. But because you don't want to carry around a whole bunch of bricks of, that's enough, we get it, okay? That's, that's what <laughs> Yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I kind of, and again, you know, I always also clarify, uh, because we are talking about logic and people really like to nitpick when people are talking about logic, which, which again, is very much welcome. It's important. It's an important part of logic. Um, but I always like to clarify, I know that paper money is not actually paper. It's a cotton blend, et cetera. But what I, so what I walk my students through is like, you know, if I, if I went to Best Buy and I took five very specific pieces of paper and not, and not even like specific as in like individual on their own, but they have very specific qualities. So they each have, you know, one zero zero written on them. They have the appropriate artwork on it and they have the appropriate kind of makeup and signatures and stamp and high tech, all kind of gizmos, well not gizmos, but high tech, um, what are they called? Holographic images in it and everything. I can take that, I can give it and I can leave with a laptop, all right? But if I go in with five different pieces of paper that are my drawings and we talk about my drawings not anyone else's because I'm terrible at drawing uh, and they do not actually carry um, kind of widespread socially imbued value <laughs> um, yet. yeah yet yet, yet. Um, you know I can't go in with some grats of bucks and take out and leave with the computer How about some and, that's be, and that's yeah and and, and that's because as a society, we have not yet gotten to the point where we appreciate Mr. Grotz or Jonathan's artwork <laughs> to the point that it has that kind of value. Um, and then I, I actually have students like list uh, various things that they 
you know, now with an understanding of, of um, social constructs, like what they think social constructs are. And then like, inevitably I'll get one student who'll be like time. And I have to clarify, I'm like, yes, kind of. Um, so like our measurements of time are kind of sort of subjective. They're, they're social constructs. Uh, and, and that's the thing, social constructs are, are kind of inherently subjective, but they function as objective, right? Right. Um, just because money is sub money doesn't subjectively have value or it only has value subjectively doesn't mean that I'm going to now stop accepting my paycheck, right? No, it functions as real. I, I'm able to use it to buy things that, that I need. Um, and then, you know, so students will bring up time and, and well, our measurements of time are social constructs like seconds, um, you know, days, years, though, especially with time, there's a lot of uh, connecting those things to objective things. So, um, right, like I, and I know there's actually, there's what? Like rotation. And yeah, like rotation of the earth, things like that. Um, and then I know there's actually been a more and more of a push within the scientific fields to anchor various measurements to objectively provable thing. I think currently the second is actually um, objectively anchored to the, um, I think like the half-life of, of some particular particle. Um, so th again, there is, they are now starting to increase and like anchoring it on objective things, but deciding that like this increment of time is important and we're going to measure that, that's social, that's a social construct. We've decided as a society to make and give significance to that. Like we could potentially take what we now consider to be two days and consider that to be one day and break things up that way. Like, you know, you work for, I don't know, like 12 hours, then you sleep for eight. And then I don't know, right. like there's, there's all kinds of other ways that we can break it up. Um, that like would still 11 days instead of a week of seven. Exactly. I, and actually I think that's, uh, that's actually probably a better example of a day, like a week versus um, a month. Or, or sorry, a week versus a day or like a month. Um, those are probably better examples of social constructs than just days because of that objective anchoring to the rotation of Earth. Um, and then, oh my goodness. I effectively won you over with, with the- Exactly, yes. <laughs> um, and then, oh my goodness, I, uh, I had a student in one of my classes um, like raise their hand and be like, Mr. Grazza, is the soul a social construct? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not touching that. I'm not. <laughs> no, see, that's when you say, absolutely it is. Sign this meaningless piece of paper <laughs> to give me possession. <laughs> and you've got to free soul yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, um, so it, w when I, the uh, student said that, I um, gave and answer that actually ended up being somewhat subjective. And I, I said, it kind of depends on what a person thinks about a soul or how you're defining the soul, et cetera. Some people believe that it's objective. Some people believe that it's a, maybe not even a material thing, but a metaphysical thing that is observable in some sense. And then, you know, other people might think that it is a social construct. So it kind of depends on what basic premises you're accepting there. Um, but I was definitely not going to <laughs> get into that in the class. And so, um, so social constructs are tricky when you're, when you're talking about logic because they are technically subjective, but because they function like they're real, because they function like they're objective. Like if you hold up a hundred dollar bill, you can say this has a value of a hundred dollars, even though that's a social construct and that value isn't inherent to that piece of paper slash cotton blend and all that stuff. Um, we still, it still makes it very difficult to function in life, question every social construct and, and, you know, pointing out every time someone goes to pay something for something in the grocery store, like, oh, well, you're using a social construct to pay for, you know, goods and services, or, you know, every time someone wears a particular outfit saying, oh, well, fashion is a social construct. Like, yeah, it, it absolutely is. And it's something to be, to be aware of and to be conscious of it, to keep in mind when you're evaluating things. But, and, and again, I definitely want to say social construct should always be reevaluated, should always be debated, should always be you know, in public discourse. 
Um, but a lot of times it makes it pretty difficult to, to function in life um, if you're just going to constantly be pointing out that social constructs are subjective and, and, and instead of kind of engaging them and using them. How many people in a society would it take to topple a social construct? <laughs> <laughs> um a specific number yeah no I, I i that would be if i gave you a number that would be fake precision and be a fallacy of fake precision oh. um which we'll talk about fallacies later um but yeah i i don't have that number i would i would default to probably like the majority or at least within a a microculture um so you can't really talk about a you know we, we can't really talk about like the u.s culture as a whole, I mean, it's certainly not homogenous, um, but you know, if we're talking about microcultures or, or things like that, I would say that if the majority of people within a microculture accept a particular social construct, then it functions as true for that that microculture. What about uh, if it's like a fifty point five percent majority, but the other forty nine point five percent? abhor violently that that's the case what oh man it, i feel like i feel like you're using a real life example here am i um <laughs> right oh man uh I, you know my i i personally really like studying the spread of ideas and and what makes an idea effective not necessarily and, and certainly in my studies logic um is not always or even often the kind of driving force between behind an idea becoming dominant, or if we're talking about social conscience, a social construct becoming dominant in the culture. Um, so I, you know, I, I would default to the majority. Uh, I don't think there's really necessarily like a, a hard threshold of, you know, well, now this is the dominant um, structure. I would say the only like kind of objective measurable thing that I could provide is majority. Um, and okay. that that technically makes it adopted by most of the people. And I, and again, you know, frankly, if we're kind of going into that a little bit more deeply, if we're talking about a culture that is is so divided that there's like fifty point five percent and forty nine point five percent on one side, I would actually probably split those into two microcultures, two like smaller groups, and talk about how it's dominant in this, it's a dominant idea in this group, or it's a. a social construct that's accepted in this group versus you know the other group where it's not not um accepted cool. and i mean that would of course kind of depend on how significant a social construct right. it is to if it warrants a, a kind of cultural distinction cool like yeah. brexit <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah yeah I would say there are a variety of, of microcultures um, that were at play there where there were different social constructs being accepted um, by different sides. Cool. Well, this is very fun and informative. <laughs> May I recap what? Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be great. So objectives are goals that you set. <laughs> <laughs> uh, objective can be proven true or false. Subjective can be uh, can't be proven true or false. Something I like Thank to add to that, yeah. So objective is something you can prove true or false, or something that you can think of a way to prove true or false. I have that. They're really small, but I didn't say it because awesome. it was too small for me to read. Awesome. Oh, uh, actually, do you have it? Do you have a little bit more time? Yeah, I do. Okay, this is part of reading classes. Yeah, I forgot about um, another type of statement to talk about. Man, this is turning into a long video. Um, <laughs> Cut it in two if need be. Yeah, we might. Um, but uh, another type of, of statement that I forgot to talk about when we we're talking about objective statements that is important, and it, and it somewhat ties in, you know, now that we're nuancing with um, the social constructs. Um, but these are, are non-falsifiable statements. And these are actually really important. Like God exists. 
That's lots so of people weather. consider, yeah, lots of people consider it to be non-falsifiable. And depending on that, that particular statement to be non-falsifiable, although I would say like whether or not it's non-falsifiable depends on your definition of the various terms within that statement. Sure. So um, I would say lots of people would say it's not non-falsifiable. And there would be some people who would say that it is non-falsifiable. But a uh, but it's really important to actually be aware of non-falsifiable statements because they're actually really tricky. Um, so non-falsifiable statements are statements that are technically objective statements, but it is impossible to know whether they're true or false. And you know, if you're listening or watching or use that, you might be like, but that goes directly against, you know, the definition of an objective statement. And yes, which is why it's, it's a problematic type of statement, um, because it presents itself as a, an objective statement, but it literally can't have it through various, I'll give an example of this in a moment, but it literally can't have truth value, um, which means that from a logical perspective, it is unusable. It is, it is not something that you can actually debate, not something you can talk about, because there's like no way. I. Like what? Math negative I in mathematics. Sure. I, I, again, I'm not as well versed in math as I, I could be to necessarily be able to say whether or not that's true. I um, don't know if it's true or not either. Okay. So the example I, the example I give, and there's going to be a word in here that is particularly uh, important and that really is what makes it non-falsifiable. Um, so I, you know, try to make up nonsense in my classes because it helps my students remember, um, remember stuff. So the example I like to give is um, undetectable and invisible half mouse fairies live on Jupiter and control the traffic in Los Angeles. Have That's the, you want to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, like on on the face of it, right? This seems like an objective statement. Right, there's, there's not any subjective statements in it. I'm not saying like these fairies are good or bad. I'm not saying that the traffic in Los Angeles is terrible. I'm not saying that, you know, Jupiter is a big planet. Um, but we, um, yeah, we're, we're, so on, the, on its face value, it seems like it is an objective statement, but it is not. I mean, it's technically an objective statement, but there's really no way to prove it true or false. Sure. And the reason being is because I'm saying it's an undetectable, um, invisible fairy. So there's literally no way to measure, there's literally no way to find out if it's true or false. And so it's really important to be careful of those types of statements because they... Be careful of using them or be careful of hearing them, being careful Both. Of both definitely don't use them because you can't have a discussion it you can't have a, you can't have a conversation about non-falsifiable statements there's there you in my opinion talk about this theory <laughs> well so, again i i would say it's it's very much a waste of time because you can't okay. come to any type of conclusion you can't come to a strong conclusion you can't come to a sound conclusion or cogent conclusion um so there's really no purpose in in discussing those statements it's it doesn't lead anywhere um, so that's, and then, so you don't want to use it for that purpose because you're disadvantaging the other person because you're giving them an unsolvable problem. And that's, you know, if it happens an accident, which people will sometimes do something like that on accident, you know, that's certainly not like morally bad or anything like that. But if you're doing it on purpose to try and stump someone or you're using a non-falsifiable statement as if it's true, that really ends up in kind of the um, logically dishonest and like the not very, it's not a very ethical approach to using logic because it's, Are it's important in logic. I think so. You know, again, that's not necessarily a logical statement in and of itself. Um, yeah. I also, I also teach ethics um, at the school I teach at and, you know, I, I definitely try to encourage um, students to use what they have learned um, in, a, in an ethical manner. Um, we can certainly talk about that some. Yeah, that, that's a topic for. Yeah. Different. Yeah. yeah. But, so, but you're saying be, that's not to use it, 
but what about hearing? What what do you do in the situation when somebody is talking like that? How do you do? You just throw your hands up and walk away. Or? Yeah. Uh, so it, it, I guess it kind of depends on the context of the conversation that's happening. Um, so if if someone is, you know, addressing an audience and you're an audience member, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you know standing up in the middle of, of the lecture and being like, that's not falsifiable and storming out. Um, if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I would certainly, I would recommend pointing that out. I'd be like, uh, you know, Zach, that's a non-falsifiable statement. So we really don't have anything to talk about. Um, and now that we've had this conversation, I know that that is an unusable part of a logical framework. There you go. <laughs> and so that, um, so, and if like the person insists on, on using it, I mean, again, at that point, there's, there's no purpose in having that conversation. It's not leading anywhere. So I would recommend not engaging um, at that point if, if people are kind of defaulting to non-falsifiable statements. Can you still be friends with them? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Friendship is a social construct. Uh, was a yes. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, you know, picking like certain people and being like, you're a special person to me, you're a special person to me, um, that could be considered a social construct. Cool. Yeah. And then a, again, I, as we're talking, I keep thinking of more things that I, I didn't address. And I think it might be wise to cut this into two parts. Um, but there is actually, and this is, is pretty important, there are actually ways to turn an objective statement into a subjective statement and how to turn some subjective statements into objective statements. Was that and I do want to- You were talking about earlier? Was that the what? The cogent thing? No, so cogent's different. That's deductive logic. That's kind of further down uh, the line. Um, and, and again, the reason it'd be useful to know these things is because subjective and objective statements serve different purposes in an argument. And uh, I think probably the most useful one is turning a subjective statement into an objective statement. Um, so you can turn an objective statement into a subjective statement very easily. You simply add a subjective word to um, to the statement. And can you five subjective words off the top of your head. Uh, best, tasty, um, strong. Um, windy, wiggity, and windy, wind, windy, yeah, windy, like the restaurant. No, not windy. Windy as in like. <laughs> windy is a subjective term. Yeah, like how how much wind or how quickly or how fast does the wind have to blow to, for it to be considered windy? I'm sure that airports have an answer to that. Well, just because airports have an answer, that doesn't mean that that's objectively true. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want my um, pilot to be objective. Like I would, well, so I would say, you know, people who live in Chicago, the windy city, have a different perspective on what day counts as windy compared or to what? Or the ADIM. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Um, or Pat Rothless uh, references. Those are always good, which yeah. is objectively true. <laughs> um last one oh um smart there we go yeah because iq doesn't count for anything oh well sure i mean like there's so many things wrong with the iq test in general but um you know the you know what measurements you use to consider someone intelligent is certainly certainly if subjective you measure a fish by how well it climbs a tree it will think it's dummy Yep. Stein, Stein, Albert. There you go. <laughs> Misattribution. Excellent. <laughs> um, and, and this is really important. And, and the reason I, I actually really want to highlight this and maybe actually even end on this, because um, you'll remember it more. Uh, but the reason I really want to highlight this is because- Would you say this uh, is a strong thing to end on? I would- um, I'm just, I'm just try, I'm I would, trying I was trying to- I need to evaluate like each statement that I'm making. But the reason this is really important is because oftentimes there will be um, statements that really seem like they're objective, 
but they actually, and all it takes is one word, um, but they're actually subjective. And what that requires for someone to do is add a whole additional argument that proves the subjective thing they're trying to consider, they're trying to get across. So the example I give in my class is, you know, if, if um, I actually, we actually analyze the Declaration of Independence, which is actually mostly subjective statements, by the way, this is very interesting. Even after they say, let, um, let the following, or let the facts, oh, how is it worded? Um, to this, then we submit the following facts or something like that. And then they list the grievances. Um, so if I say that King George taxed, taxed the colonies, right? That's an objective statement. That's something we could measure. We could look up historical documents. We could track those payments. That's an objective statement. But as soon as you add King George tax the colonies like a jerk, right? That like a jerk, that's now subjective. And not only do you have to prove that King George taxed the colonies, you have to provide a strong argument, a convincing argument, an effective argument that convinces your audience that King George was in fact acting like a jerk. And that's a whole additional burden of proof. Would, would this be, um, so in, in like psychology talking about, uh, well, okay, I was, I was going to say it, maybe, I, I, the, um, the hypnosis, for instance, one of the examples they use of conversational hypnosis is you've got the conscious mind, which acts as a guardian at the gate, and you use your language to slip information past while it's looking at the wrong. Yep. Would that be an example of you're having an objective statement, but you're slipping in a whole lot of crap? Yes, exactly, exactly. And so, and, and you'll see that all the time. Um, and again, that's a generalization, I guess. But you, you will see that pretty frequently is, is there will be objective statements. And as soon as you add something in, um, then that you're you're now requiring a whole additional set of evidence to support the subjective part of the statement. And again, that doesn't mean that it's bad, right? I, I think personally, I think the Declaration of Independence lays out a pretty strong argument for King George being a jerk and his manner of taxation and um, kind of interaction with the colonies, right? So I think I think they provide a strong argument for that, but it's definitely not a sound argument they're not using only objective statements right they're not just even though they say let us list the facts they don't actually just list facts because they they insert all like really regularly in their facts they insert little like um jabs at king george which which require additional levels of proof to prove that particular part and i think that's what i i think especially in public discourse in the us and i'm sure in the uk as well i think a lot of what is happening is people are making a are making subjective statements that seem like they're objective and they only have a couple words in there that are subjective and there's little to no evidence being provided or little to no argumentation being provided for that additional burden of proof that that's required to kind of when provide a strong argument required, what what uh, what's the harm that's subjective what, what's it's subjective the so when i say required i you know it I'm kind of targeting that at people who would accept the, my definitions of strong and weak arguments. Yes. So for if, it, you know, if you agree that a strong argument should be made up mostly of objectively true statements um, with, you know, that subjective interpretation that's going on, but that subjective interpretation follows well-tested models, then, you know, if you accept that, then, you know, I think you might accept my requirements for, a, a, for an argument. Okay, but but what what is the why is that bad? So again, bad is is technically a subjective statement. Um, so I think it's bad because it um, bypasses people's critical thinking skills. And that's one thing that, you know, I, re I really want this series to be is, is something that develops people's critical thinking skills because it, these aren't really skills that like, you know, these concepts of subjective objective, these aren't really things that, that people talk about regularly. They aren't things that are 
necessarily in the the knowledge of of everyday people and right. you know they might know some of the concepts of it or you know maybe they've heard of the scientific method maybe they've heard some you know logical concepts maybe they know what valid means things like that but there's definitely um not a whole lot of cohesive kind of education um regarding logic and critical thinking and i think it uh, the reason i think this particular thing can be bad is because it allows people who know more about argumentation know more about rhetoric know more about logic slip in some concepts or some um, opinions that can become internalized without really being given the option um, to critically think through them so i think and, and again this isn't always intentional right someone might accidentally throw in a subjective word we're not really necessarily talking about that i don't think that's bad i don't think you know i don't think accidentally making something subjective is bad but a, a lot of times it can be intentionally used you said i don't think that's bad if you had just said that's not bad that's an objective statement that would be subjective because of the i so yeah so saying that's not bad is subjective because bad is a subjective term but if i said i don't think that's bad that's technically objective but again i'm not talking about my internal thoughts that's not the important part the it being bad is is um okay. that part so that's something not necessarily that's something really to be aware of when you're when you're consuming media when you're cons when you're watching people speak uh, or listening to people speak even when you're listening to you know zach and i as we're, we're talking about things i'm practically sure that i have certainly said some things that are subjective i'm kind of treating them as objective even in this conversation even while i'm trying to be self-reflective about what i'm saying but uh, so that kind of self-awareness of, of what people are saying is going to be important so that you know like hey they need to prove this additional stuff before i can kind of take what they're saying at face value mm -hmm. now i think that can be super useful for consuming information but i think that turning a subjective statement into an objective statement is actually the more useful one when you're creating an argument and the easiest way to turn a subjective statement into an objective statement is to provide a point of reference ah so it's like a parable um not quite okay, uh, point of reference. Uh, i'm trying to think here i want to try to do an example and then you okay if I'm, um um give me give me a subjective statement and i'll try and turn it to objective jonathan is tall Jonathan is as tall as the Empire State Building if the Empire State Building was <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I I don't even know how to evaluate that sentence. <laughs> um, so I nailed it, right? That's, yeah, there we go. Uh, that was an effective statement. <laughs> uh, if your goal was to confuse me. Um, <laughs> Jonathan is as tall as a tall tree. Ah, uh, so I'd say, I'd say it's still subjective. Jonathan uh, is six foot seven inches tall, which is in the top three percentile of men in America. So that's, yeah, now you're talking about objective statements. That's a fact. I would say that that really fundamentally kind of changed the sentence that I was using instead of just adding to it. Um, but the easiest way, and, and this is, again, without using like actual data or for my height, um, the easiest way is to provide a point of reference. So, for example, Jonathan is taller than Zach. Oh, that was way easier. Right. So, or, or you know, another example I give is um, like winter is cold. That's a subjective statement because of the word cold. Right. But if you say winter is colder than summer, or if you want to get like super technical, like winter is cold, is on average colder than summer in New England, which is very true. <laughs> um, you know, that's, you know, and people can say like, oh, well, it depends. You know, last year there was a weird, you know, sure. Yes, but we're talking, you know, if you look at the data over an extended period of time, it's there, you can always certainly kind of narrow that down. But providing a point of reference turns a subjective statement into an objective statement, which again, 
you can now use in deductive logic. So that's another, that's another kind of transformation between subjective and objective or vice versa that is, so, is useful in argumentation. So even something like, okay, you all heard me play the mandolin earlier. If I were to say, Zach is the best mandolinist in this room, that's an objective statement. And it's, it appears to have value and mean something, but realistically, I'm alone in this room. Sure. So yeah, that's, that's definitely an objective statement. And, and again, uh, you know, objective doesn't necessarily mean useful um, and, and, or even like maybe relevant to the conversation. But yeah, that's absolutely a, a, an objective statement. Um, or, you know, because if, you know, if we say Jonathan is tall, I mean, you know, compared to most people I am. But if we compare me to a mountain, <laughs> or, the Empire State Building. or the Empire State Building, <laughs> uh, made of chocolate while it's raining, to kind of bring <laughs> our examples full circle, um, then you know that's that's, um, yeah, yeah. I forget exactly where I was going with that. But but those are some really those are some useful transformations that you can use with subjective and objective statements. An argumentation. Um, so you can turn an objective statement into a subjective statement by adding a subjective word to it. And this is something that we usually have a, a pretty, like, you know, we usually have a pretty good ear for that, even though, even if we don't have any formal training, like, I don't have to give you a list of all the subjective words in the English language, because some of that even depends on context. Um, but, you know, if, if you're here, if you hear something in a statement that is, is not objective, that's not a fact, that's an opinion, something infused in, then that turns a whole statement into a subjective statement. And that requires additional argumentation. And then you can turn a subjective statement into an objective statement by providing a point of reference. Cool. And I think that pretty much sums up everything I could possibly want to say on subjective and objective. Great. Now, now I'll go through. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got my reading glasses on. I had to get reading glasses. Did I tell you that? I don't think you did. Wow. Yeah. They look I, sharp. Uh, Metaphorically I mean, speaking. They look the same ish. The lenses are different, but um, I got really weak eyeball muscles apparently. And That's so, so I've fun. been seeing double vision and uh, it happens. My eyes tire out too easily. And hmm. so I have to wear reading glasses to prevent them from tiring out to stop double vision. So your eyeball muscles use primarily subjective statements? Yeah, they weak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am sorry to hear that. Uh, objective can be proven true or false, or you can think of a way to prove it true or false. Subjective cannot be proven true or false. Deductive uses only objective statements follows logical frameworks like equations and arrives at a necessarily true conclusion. Good so far? Yep. Nailed it. Inductive uses subjective and or objective. It can be strong or weak and it comes down to a subjective conclusion. Uh, strong, you, you want to go from strong to weakest in an academic sort of paper, you leave them with the best, or you can use the inverted pyramid method <laughs> first, or the empty Oreo method and just don't provide it. Uh, strong uses mostly objectively true statements, which is important because you don't want to use objectively false statements. Um, and weak uses mostly subjective statements or objectively false, would that be fair? Yeah, yeah. Um, facts don't usually give necessary information. Uh, they require subjective to provide meaning. Sure. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, meaning and interpretation, yeah. Uh, effective argument achieves its goal. And we didn't talk about defining goals, uh, so we'll do goal setting next time you know really <laughs> social constructs are something that exist because we agree and they're technically subjective but feel objective because of social pressure uh or not 
it feels real because people believe it's real. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Non-falsifiable statements are tricky because they're technically objective, but there's no way to, to prove it. And they are unusable in logical frameworks. Get out of here. That's what I would say to non-falsifiable statements. I'd say, hey, you get out of here. And then, and then we'd still be friends. <laughs> uh, and to take an objective and make it subjective, you add a subjective word. It's super simple and can technically be kind of manipulative of people that don't know what's going on. So ethics, eh? And then uh, subjective to objective, add a point of reference, you big dummy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So maybe this should have been a much shorter video. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 we'll cut it down to that last. Yeah, well, that last two minutes. <laughs> cool. Well, thank awesome. you, Johnny. That was fun and enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be good. Uh, next time, we'll kind of start talking about inductive logic um, and specifically um, kind of bad inductive logical arguments talking about fallacies that'll probably make up several episodes because there's a lot of fallacies to discuss how many fallacies um, are there i mean probably uh an infinite amount i know there's um i i mean it, you know fallacies are are well we'll, we'll talk about yeah, fallacies we, next we'll, episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about fallacies next episode uh, there's a lot. An there's a lot. number of videos on fallacies. There we go. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Oh man. Yeah. I'll plan it out. Awesome. Awesome. Logic magicians, we are the best. Logic magicians, best is subjective. Best is subjective. You don't use that now. Strong and weak arguments. They are really fun. Perfect. Thank you for well, watching, everybody. Yeah, thanks. We'll uh, see, see you next you. time. <laughs>